morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to Kyoto. Now, my paper deals with the importance of history in international comic study, the importance of the context in understanding and analyzing the comics and cartoons we read. However, I would like to qualify to say that I'm not privileging context over text or vice versa based on abstract I've submitted, which most of you have. Now, both context and text are equally important in our understanding of comics and manga. How it works, why it works, and why it is important. Basically, we need both text and context. Without the primary text, there's no history or analysis for us to work on, or even the pain joy of reading comics. But understanding the context is equally vital as well to assessing any cultural works. If we were to isolate comics or manga from their context and ignore any of the ideological or political undercurrents they might possess, we are stripping them of their potential role to reflect or even affect some of the changes we see in society. And we mustn't forget that cartoons can bring down the gods. So this is just one example, um, Thomas Ness and Tammany Hall in America in the 19th century. Now from where I come from, based on my research and digging into the comics, cartoon history of Singapore and Malaysia, cartoons have always been a force for change in society. One cannot escape history or the context and simply focus on aesthetics or form. I'll elaborate on this by giving you a brief history of cartooning in Singapore. Most of you would know that Singapore, located near the equator, was a British colony founded by Sir Stanford Raffles in 1819. Now, cartoons came to Singapore almost a century later in 1907, where political forces, rather than commercial or cultural ones, brought satirical images to the public in Singapore. It was the emergence of radical politics and revolutionary Chinese newspaper, namely Zhongxin Rebao, that brought forth cartoons and its historical role in Singapore. It's a role that cartoons will play for the rest of the 20th century in Singapore. Zhongxin Rebao, which ran from 1907 to 1910, was an organ of the Singapore Tong Ming Wei, the revolutionary party set up by Dr. Sun Yat San, Sun Chong San. The Chinese revolutionaries saw the potential of cartoons in getting their message across to the public. The mass media, words and pictures, was meant to serve the propaganda purposes of Dr. Sun's vision for a new China. Dr. Sun himself wrote articles in Zhongxin Rebao under a pen name. The first Chinese cartoon in Singapore appeared in September 1907 edition of Zhongxin Rebao. This was the first time a Chinese newspaper in Singapore carried pictorials other than those in advertisements. A total of 41 cartoons was published, were published from 9 September 1907 to 21st March 1908. All the cartoons were anti-Qing Dynasty cartoons attacking the corrupt Manchu government in China. As shown above, the appearance of Chinese cartoons in Singapore was not accidental, but a deliberate effort on the part of revolutionaries to use cartoons as a tool for agitation against the Qing government in China. The cartoons were geared towards shaping the mindset of its readers with regards to the tyranny of the Qing dynasty. Therefore, cartooning was a serious business in Singapore. Even with the fall of the Qing government in 1911 and the setting of the Chinese Republic, Chinese politics continued to dominate the content of Chinese cartoons in Singapore. Cartoons continued to go up the savage mirror during this period. Now, what is interesting is that we see signs of globalization at work here. <coughs> Let me give you this example. This 1918 cartoon from Warming Rebao, from, uh, which ran from 1914 to 1919, shows Western influences on Chinese cartoonists in Singapore. This cartoon is entitled Pleasures of a Beach Drunken. And the figure drawn here is to caricature a corrupt Chinese government official. And this character, if you look at it, looks suspiciously like Jigs of uh, Jock McManus' Bring Up Father. The famous uh, American comic strip was first published in 1913 and could have made its way to Singapore by 1918. This cartoon is revealing in using Jigs as a symbol of decadence and corruption, showing what the Chinese thought of the West and maybe specifically America. So it's not just world history that informs us of cartoons that we are studying, but the history of cartooning itself. As we have seen, cartoons were in service of politics and society. It was hard for the masses to serve a cause and to rouse public sentiments. 
We see this at work when cartoons became part of the anti-Japanese campaign from 1937 onwards after the Marco Polo Bridge incident of 7 July 1937. Japan started its formal invasion of China and cartoons in China and Singapore were drawn to rally the people to support the war effort against Japan. Cartoons were printed in the news pages and even on the front page as shown here. Newspaper cartoons focused their entire output on the war effort. Of course, there was a price to pay for all this. The Japanese started their invasion of Southeast Asia in December 1941, and the British defense of Singapore crumbled in February 1942. The fall of Singapore was one of Britain's darkest moments, and the Japanese occupation itself was the darkest period for Singapore cartooning in the 20th century. Several cartoonists were killed during the Suqing, the Japanese army operation to purge suspected anti-Japanese elements among the Jap Chinese population conducted in February 1942. Many prominent cartoonists who contributed to the war effort were killed. With the end of the war in 1945, cartoonists took up their pens again to depict their lives under the Japanese occupation. I will cite the example of uh, Chop Sui by Liu Kang. Chop Sui is a collection of cartoons about life under the Japanese occupation and is drawn and released very quickly after the war ended. Liu Kang, the artist who had gone through life and death situations during the war, wanted to put out a cartoon book to document the Japanese atrocities during the occupation. He chose a cartoon format to present his experience and those of others because cartoons were the most direct and popular form of expression and medium. 